Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Looks like we got another cold front coming in, though. It's hot last week, and now it'll be cold. One person thought that was funny. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny, but I guess that's what you can do. All you have to do is laugh at Cleveland weather because we can't control it, right? So it's just up to us how do we have a good attitude or bad attitude about it. In fact, I want to share this. I had a, saw a really cool quote um, at work. This has nothing to do with my sermon. Well, I guess everything is related, but I want to share the quote with you. You cannot have a bad day with a good attitude, and you cannot have a good day with a bad attitude. Anyway, I like that quote. I thought I'd share it with you. So, brethren, we um, are in a holy day right now. I think sometimes we think that, well, the holy days are the Passover, the days of unleavened bread, and then when that's over, it's done, we're not in any holy day season, and then all of a sudden Pentecost is another holy day, but I think sometimes we forget, I know Bill reminded us in the last day of unleavened bread, but all of these 50 days are actually a connected holy day. It's called the Feast of Weeks. So the Feast of First Fruits is Pentecost. It's called Pentecost because of this. it's 50 days after that Sabbath during the Days of Unleavened Bread, but it's called the Feast of Weeks as well, and you could go and actually see scriptural support for that in Exodus chapter 34, Deuteronomy 16, 2 Chronicles 8, if you want to look it up. And so if we think about the Holy Days, you know, Passover is really a spiritual begettle. We know that. It's when God's Spirit, for those of us who are baptized, and the Passover represents us taking on Christ, imbibing Christ, that God's Spirit connects with our spirit and we become new creatures in Christ. And then first fruits represents us being born into our new physical bodies at Christ's return. So then the Feast of Weeks would be synonymous with that physical representation of the development period from conception to birth, right? So we are now living in a development period in our lives. This world is like the womb. We are developing. And so we should be growing. We should see progress in our lives. We should be developing Every day we should be growing spiritually and growing with all of those talents and fruits of the Spirit. So I thought that as we're told to, to preach in season, I would like to take the opportunity to have more of a kind of a, a um, sermon that talks about how we can create an environment in our lives so that we can develop to the best that we can during this time frame. What I want to talk about is something that if we don't have it, it could be extremely debilitating and we might not be aware that it's happening. What I want to talk about, brethren, anyone know what this is? That if you don't have this, it's almost impossible for you to live your life. What do you think? Perseverance. Let me tell you a story. So anyone ever hear of a Dizzy Izzy? You know what that is? So we did this one time. It was with some recruiters for the military before I even went in. We did a picnic. And a Dizzy Izzy is where it's like, a, you know, you're out at a picnic. And there's two people, two lines, so two teams. And there's two baseball bats about 50 feet away. So you run out there, you grab the baseball bat, and you put it down in the ground, and you put your head on it, and then you have to spin around it five times, and then you have to run back. What do you think what happens to people when they start running back? They think they're standing up. They think they're running this way, but they're leaning like this, running this way. A lot of them fall over and we laugh and think it's funny. It's called the Dizzy Izzy. Now, I guess I'm not saying we should do that because it could be a little bit dangerous, but it was definitely funny. And the point is, brethren, 
Imagine physically living your life without balance. We take it for granted. I'm standing up here. I'm not falling over. I know where I am. I have balance. Now, some people go through vertigo. I was thinking of this golfer. I think he won the, a major tournament a couple years ago. One of the top golfers in the world. He had vertigo during the tournament. Somehow he was able to steady himself when he was swinging, but when he was walking, his caddy sometimes had to carry him. I guess he fell over on the course a couple times. Think of how difficult it was, what a feat that was for him to actually win that tournament. Any of you ever had vertigo? My mom suffers with it. What's it like when you get it, George? Yeah. Terrible. Terrible. Why? You can't do anything, can you? You can't do anything. You can't go anywhere. It's unsettling. So what I want to talk about, brethren, is balance. That without balance, it's extremely difficult for us to function, let alone grow and develop into the destined potential that God has for all of us. So I think of balance. Okay, well, I've heard the expression, you know, we're supposed to have a balanced diet. Now, I've looked at all these different things with diet. I've read all these different diets. You have the protein diet, the vegetarian diet. Every one of them has a flaw. And every time I read this, I come back to the point, well, you know what? You just got to have a balanced diet. Eat vegetables, eat some protein. Who can argue that? Balanced training. If you're an athlete, athletes achieve their best potential when they train from different angles and they have balance in their training, both strength and endurance. You hear a lot now about the work life balance nowadays, where, see, back in the day, People worked out of their homes. I don't know if you realize this, but up, up until the Industrial Revolution, almost every person's business and trade was out of their home. Nowadays, because most people work away from home, there's this big issue of the work-life balance. So that's another big topic. I see balance everywhere I look in nature. I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Of course, balance is critical for us to function. So it's intuitive, right? You can imagine that Balance is a good thing, yet I would ask, why is it so hard? Maybe before I ask that question, I'd ask you, do you think you have balance in your life? Maybe a different way to ask it. Is there evidence of imbalance in your life? You can think more than just physically. Think spiritually, emotionally, your relationships. Actually, if you think about it, balance is extremely difficult to optimize in your life. There's a lot of pulls, a lot of distractions, things that keep us from living balanced lives. I'll talk about that more as we go as well. But the point of what I want to talk about today is really that as Christians, and there's evidence for this in the Bible, as Christians, we have to demonstrate and exemplify balance in our lives. So I want to talk about where we see it. I was thinking about it, and I started looking at nature, and you see symmetry. Just look at a pine tree. You notice when something's not right. If it was crooked, like the leading hour of pizza, you'd say, ah, that just doesn't look right, does it? It's probably not healthy. It'll probably die after a while. But when it's perfectly straight, perfectly symmetric, perfectly balanced, it's beautiful, isn't it? You know, they've done studies about beauty, what people find attractive. Do you know what that is? The results? It's symmetry. They usually say when you have a perfectly symmetric face, Your eyes are perfectly distanced. There's symmetry. You don't have one eyebrow cocked above the other one, or whatever. Like I have one eyebrow that kind of goes up. I know when I look at myself, 
this part of my body is actually less developed than this part. I have a whole bunch of things that's wrong with me that I notice. Luckily, when you're wearing clothes, hopefully you guys don't notice all these things. But they say that what they've done these studies, what people define as attractive is really symmetry. You can think about it too. When someone has good posture, standing upright, perfectly balanced on their skeletal frame, confidence, it looks good, right? When someone's slouching over, imbalanced, you notice it. No, God actually programmed in balance through the Sabbath. I don't know if you ever thought about that. For six days he worked. He doesn't want all work. Sabbath, rest. Work and rest. You can look at the laws of physics. Conservation of energy and matter. I mean, I remember in college taking engineering classes, everything that we did was a mass balance. Energy on this side of the equal sign equaled energy on this side of the equal sign. Mass was equal to this. There was balance in everything. Balance in the universe. Wayne Hendricks has spent a lot of time talking about this anthropic principle, which says that there are a group of scientists that have studied the universe and realized and come to the conclusion that there is so much order, so much symmetry, so much balance in the earth. The fact that there's water can have three phases here because there's ice at the caps and there's water vapor in the equator. You have water as solid liquid gas, perfect balance and perfect harmony. Our weather patterns, we have hot, we have cold. If it was always cold, we'd all die. If it was always hot, we'd all die. But because of the seasons, because of the polar caps and the warmth in the equator, it drives this Hadley cell. It's called the cycle of water flow and currents and, and air that brings us weather and helps keep it stable so that we could actually survive here. The balance of the perfect distance from the sun so that we don't fly off into space with the centrifugal force. We stay in orbit. Just the perfect distance. There's, I can go on and on and on and on. And what I conclude is to start thinking about the universe and God's creation is that balance is actually an attribute of God. Can you imagine God not being balanced? That's kind of scary if you think about it. Think about sports teams. You know, there was a basketball team that set some great records this year. Some would think that they're the best team in the NBA right now, probably going to win the championship. I'm talking about the Cavaliers, of course. Sorry for you that are in San Francisco, but I'm a, I'm a Cavs fan. But so I think about it like a basketball team. I've never been a basketball fan, but I'm learning a lot about the game, and I start to realize and appreciate that you cannot win a championship in any sport without balance. Now the Cavs are a great three-point team, but they could also play good half court, or um, they, they also can drive to the paint or the net, however you call it. I'm not a basketball guy. Darren's laughing at me, basketball coach over here. They have good ball movement. They spread it around. You don't have one person scoring everything. There's balance in the scoring. They have speed when they need it, and then they slow it down, have a good half-court game, they play good defense. They're physical at times, sometimes they have good finesse. You think about it, when a team has good balance, they're tough to beat. My point, brethren, is this translates also to us, to our church. You know, our church, our mission, if all we did was one thing only, there'd be other things that are critical for the health of the organization that we wouldn't be taking care of. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, we have to have balance in our lives for us to be champions. When I say champions, I don't mean champions at you know, a sport. 
what is the destiny, our full potential of what God wants us to be. He wants us to be born into spirit as these awesome creatures with power. For us to reach that potential, we have to get our lives under control. You know, Jesus was certainly balanced. Over here in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, let's go ahead and turn there. It's a small scripture, but I want to think about it a little bit because it's easy to read over it. I want to meditate on this one scripture or verse. And you'll see as we do that, I, I think it makes a good case that that Jesus absolutely was a balanced person. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. This was talking about Jesus as he was growing up and developing as a human being. It says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. Now think about that. He increased in wisdom. Wisdom is about the mind, the intellect. In stature, physical. I think it's physical. He just grew up and became strong and healthy physically. Favor with God. Talking about his relationship with God the Father. Spiritual matters. He grew spiritually and also with man. So Jesus was growing in all of these different areas, nothing left undone. I think that implies balance in Jesus' life. Think about what he did. He was a carpenter, he worked. But he didn't only work. He traveled. But he didn't only travel. He preached. He prayed. He actually went to parties. Remember, Jesus was at a wedding. His first miracle was to create wine because they were about to run out of wine and, hey, you can't run out of wine at a party. It implies that Jesus knew that there was a time to go have some fun and celebrate. He meditated alone, but he also spent time with a lot of people. He fasted, and he ate. Sometimes he healed, sometimes he didn't. Sometimes he challenged the status quo and got angry. Other times he decided, I'm not going to fight this battle, I'm getting out of here. You can read all of these examples if you read through the Gospels. Sometimes he demonstrated his authority, sometimes he withheld it. Maybe a different way to think about it is imagine an unbalanced Jesus. Imagine Jesus overeating. Can you imagine that? Ugh, I ate too much. I can't imagine it. Imagine Jesus drunk. Imagine Jesus speeding 95 miles an hour down a highway if they had highways back then. I gotta get there, weaving in and out of traffic. Imagine Jesus as a workaholic. How about Jesus fearful and neurotic? Oh, I can't touch this because it might have germs on it. Or not to, I don't want to make fun of people, but hey. Imagine Jesus fearful about whatever it is. Imagine Jesus never, ever being sad. You know, sometimes there are people who think they always have to have the happy face on. On the other side, imagine Jesus always being depressed. How you doing? Hanging in there.
Imagine Jesus obsessing about his diet or obsessing about exercise or obsessing about politics or obsessing about anything for that matter. Imagine Jesus never wanting to work, just wanting to lay around and just be comfortable all the time. These things just don't fit, do they? It kind of goes to our common sense that when we read and learn about Jesus, Jesus would, none of these things would fit. Yet how many of us are guilty of some of those things that I've said? So is there imbalance in your life, any evidence of imbalance in your life? Well, maybe if you were to, able to connect with anything I said, even to certain degrees, compared to that standard that's Jesus, we have some work to do. Look over here in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus even told us that we are to love with balance. Matthew chapter 22, and this is when everything kind of boils down to this, that's the royal law here. Verse 34, actually, uh, verse 35, one of them which was a lawyer asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God, Theos, or I, I think it's, uh, if you look at the, at the Greek, it's Theos, with all your heart, emotionally, with all your soul, spiritually, and with all your mind, intellectually. So just even how we love God, there's supposed to be a balance there. And then the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Think of the Ten Commandments. Love God first. The Sabbath. Give yourself a rest. Then the next commandment, love your family, your father and mother. Honor your mom and dad. Then the next one after that, honor your wife or your husband. No adultery. The rest after that, honor people. Balance, even in the commandments. Jesus talks about balance and justice. He says in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, when he says, don't stress about when you see injustice in the world. He says, I will repay. Vengeance is mine. The Apostle Paul substantiated this. Look over here in Philippians chapter 4. We'll go in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Here the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to have joy in life. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. So here the Apostle Paul is telling us we should have moderation in our lives. Avoid extremes in anything. You can reference 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5. Apostle Paul drives the point home even more, talking about, how to, talking about being sober, not being drunk, being ready. But I want to read through Titus chapter 2, because this is a great example of how we should have balance in our lives and how we live our lives, brethren. Let's turn over to, chapter, to Titus chapter 2.
verse 1. But speak you the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, now, he's not saying, you know, get crazy with parties, go out all the time, get drunk, be frivolous, go to extremes. I'm not saying that at all. It's the opposite. Under control. When I read this, I picture someone in perfect control of themselves and their lives. Age men, be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Aged women, likewise, they that be in behavior as becomes holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Think about our culture nowadays, what we celebrate in our culture. Look at the little apps on your iPhones. Have, I have this little Fox News app, and it shows me like some good headlines of news, and in the bottom it shows like all the tabloids. If you read those tabloids and you start seeing what's on the tabloids and you, you compare it to this, it's like, wow. Our culture is moving in a def- d- direction away from balance, brethren. It says here in verse 4 that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that, they, that the word of God be not blasphemed, that they're respectful. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works. In other words, treat others that way. Treat your wives the same way. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, I'll talk about that more in a little bit, worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope, here's why, because we know that we are looking toward achieving that destiny that God has in store for us. The glorious appearing of that great God of our Savior Jesus Christ. We're in our Feast of Weeks. This is talking about the Feast of First Fruits when he returns. Brethren, this is talking about living our lives with control and balance. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says that he has to keep his body under subjection, to have discipline. We must do the same. So I think, you know, we look at these scriptures, I think it's pretty clear, brethren, that God exemplifies balance. Jesus was certainly balanced, and he expects us to be as we are lights to others in this world. So I want to shift gears a little bit and ask the question, so what drives imbalance? Why does this happen? We, we know it's good. Think about it in your lives. What are the things that, in your life that causes you to be too focused on one thing and neglect other things? It might be different for every one of us, but hopefully you're all thinking of the one or two things that you contend with. You might think it's a good thing. Is it wrong to be too focused on a good thing? I would say yes. Because when you're focused too much on one thing, no matter how good it is, what are you doing over here? There's other things we're neglecting. So what are the two things I can think of? If I distill it down, I can think of two things at the foundation that cause us to have imbalance in our lives. The first one, anyone want to take a guess? 
That's my second one. So you were wrong. <laughs> if it was anybody else, I would have said you were right. <laughs> For those on the camera, that was my dad who said that, so I had to give him a little bit. Okay, desire, coveting is one of them. What's the other one? How about fear? Think about it. Fear. Fear of failure might lead someone to put too much focus on work. Fear of embarrassment might cause someone never to want to take a chance, get out there and meet people or do things. Fear for our safety or security causes a whole bunch of stress and neuroses and psychoses and I know, I have kids, I worry about them all the time, and really it's fear. You know, my faith as a mustard seed, if it was strong enough, I'd know that God's got angels around him, he's going to take care of them. But how much do I stress and worry because of fear? Fear for safety, for security. I'm sure you can come up with more examples of how fear can cause you to focus unhealthily if that's a word. I feel like Mr. Watson now. <laughs> Gets you to focus too much on the wrong things or on one thing. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Isn't the life more than meat and the body than raiment? In other words, she's saying don't be stressed about these things. Don't be fearful about all these things. God tells us that the Spirit, His Spirit casts out fear. It's through God's Holy Spirit that we can overcome it, and we should not be fearful. So if you see imbalance in your life, look and see if there's really something behind it, some fear that's causing you to do that, and then deal with it, pray about it. God says he'll help you overcome it, and he'll help you to remove that thing that's causing the imbalance so that you could get your life back where it needs to be. The other one, as my dad said, is desire. Desire can cause imbalance. Now, is all desire wrong? Of course not. Doesn't God desire passionately for us to be born into his family? We're told in Revelation that God doesn't like lukewarm attitudes or lukewarm passion. He wants zeal. Desire. That's good. You can't accomplish anything, brethren, if you don't have desire to do it. God wants us to desire salvation. To desire Him. Now, when we're focused and we're dealing with something in the short term with passion and zeal, is our life out of balance? I'd say yes for that merry period of time. So I'd have to say that if I think about balance, I have to look at it over the long term. Because there are times, brethren, where the situation commands that we focus and put everything out of our mind and get this done right now. Even the provision for the Sabbath, if there's an ox in the ditch, if there's an emergency, right? Or if your car runs off the road. I guess the point is, brethren, is desire is not bad, but an unhealthy desire that causes us to sacrifice or neglect all the other important things in our lives, that becomes a problem. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10 told us, everything we do, do it with might. So God wants that zeal. He wants focus when we set our hand to do something, but he wants us to balance it out when we're done with it. And of course, the commandment, the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet, which is an unhealthy desire. 
So if we continue to read here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, here's what Jesus tells us about desiring, about coveting. It says, Behold the fowls of the air, just continuing to read from what I read before, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? And he continues to go on and talk about how God's taking care of the universe. He's taking care of birds. He's taking care of his creation. How much more should we have faith that God will take care of us? You know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says you can't always get what you want, but you get what you need. Some of you are shaking your heads, yes. (laughs) Can you tell me where that scripture is? (laughs) Who? Oh, the who. But actually, it's one of those things. It's not a scripture. At least, I don't know. Maybe it is in here. Maybe this is it. God's telling us through Matthew. Jesus was telling us, look, you're not always going to get what you want, but have faith. God will give you what you need. You don't have to be stressed out about it. He says, if you just focus on the right things in your life, if you have balance in your life, the right balance, things will take care of themselves. If you continue to read on here. As I mentioned, balance then, and therefore, must be viewed over the long term. Because, like I said, sometimes when you have to get something done, you've got to focus. And when you're focusing, that's all you're focusing on. So how can we do this? How can we achieve balance in our lives, brethren? I'd say it's about time management. Turn with me over to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. How many of you like that song? I don't remember who sang it. Mamas and Papas or something like that. To talk, they actually put this Ecclesiastes chapter 3 to a song. To everything there is a time or season. I don't know the words. But I hear it. it's one of my favorite songs. Probably because it was a hit and it's also one of the most profound scriptures to me in the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. So, brethren, there is a time for everything. God does not want us to spend all of our time on one thing, even if it's a good thing. He doesn't want us to every day, every hour of the day, Bible study. God doesn't want that because there's a time for it but there's also a time to put it down and get out and talk to people. There's a time for everything. A time to be born, a time to die. He doesn't want us to only be happy all the time because what learning is there? How can we empathize with other people if we don't also suffer the way Jesus suffered and now can empathize with us? There's a time to plant and a time to pluck up. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get. It's not wrong to go out and get something. But that's not all you should be focused on. There's a time to let it go, to give it away. A time to keep and a time to cast away. Time to rend and a time to sow. In other words, a time to split things up and a time to pull things together. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. I know this one thing that I have to struggle with at work sometimes. I'm learning how to do it. Bite my lip. Keep my mouth shut. 
and in three sentences, someone else says exactly what I was thinking. I'm like, okay, cool. A time to love. And brethren, God's telling us here that there is a time to hate. I think of the scripture where Jesus said, be angry and sin not. And yes, there is a time for war, but also a time for peace. I read this, brethren, I realize that God created an environment with all of these experiences for us so that we can learn and grow and develop and experience all that there is that life can give us. God created this environment for us. He wants balance in our lives. He wants us to experience all of these things and learn how to deal with it and manage it in control. So how can we implement, first of all, assess and implement balance? I said that the way to do it is by looking at our time. So I created a sheet for us. Could hand pass it around. And I'll show you what it is for the camera. There you go. I created a worksheet called Assessing Balance in Your Life. And zoom in there. I don't know if you can see the reading on it, but it's basically a table with four columns. And I just brainstormed a few things. You can cross those out and write your own things that are important to you in your life. And I don't know how other way, a, a different way to assess balance in our lives than to look at how we spend our time. Because that, to me, how we spend our time is an indication of what's in our hearts and in our minds. Where we spend our time. So the first column here is different attributes of our lives, God's spirituality. I thought it would be good to break out the time spent with your spouse, your family, your friends. Health, fitness, fun, knowledge, you can add more things. What I put here, I did this for myself, how many hours in the past month did you spend on these activities or in these focus areas? If you don't do hours, put numbers of stars. If you spend a lot of time, give it five stars. If you spend a little bit of time, give it one. The point is just to give you a sense when you look at this, and it was pretty amazing for me when I did it, to look at it and go, wow. I'm spending a lot of time on these two or three things. They're good things, but I need to spend more time over on these things. So I challenge you to go ahead and be honest with yourself. Look at the last month, last couple months, whatever works for you, that long term that you want to assess how you have balance in your life. You can rate it with numbers of stars. You can rate it with a one through five scale. You could rank them one through whatever. Or you could put the actual hours if you can think of it. The next column after the time you spent is what you'd like it to be. It's always nice to say, here's what it is. Here's what I'd like it to be. And then some ideas or actions that you can write down and I'd encourage you to actually write them down, even if you don't look at it again, there's something that happens in our brains when we write something down, it's like we're making a commitment to ourselves. It burns in our memory. If you can't remember someone's name, write their name down, and you'll have a much better chance of remembering their name. Write down some actions that you're going to take to start changing the amount of time you spend, and you will start to achieve better balance in your life, brethren. If you, do, if you can do this and achieve this and strive for it, brethren, I would submit you will have more peace of mind. You'll have less stress in your life. You'll actually have better health because you'll be finding time to rest. You'll have fun. You'll have better relationships because you'll be spending more time with the people that are important in your life. You'll have a better relationship with God because you'll be spending more time with Him. 
You'll have more energy. You'll have more joy and happiness. It's worth it. And these things are important because we are to be lights to the world. And let Christ's light shine to other people. And how are people going to be attracted to us and then to Christ if our lives are all out of whack? Doing this will create that healthy environment, brethren, for us to develop and flourish and thrive in our growth toward Christian character. We will start becoming more like Christ. May God help you, brethren, and also help me, all of us, to find maintain and maintain a healthy balance in everything that we do.